there's like a mainstream perspective that, you know, the Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy and, you know, America's the good guy. And, you know, just whatever you read in your history books is reality. And, you know, whatever you go to school and they teach you, that's reality. And when you, that's like normal. Right. And then when you grow up like I did, where it's just like, no, there are conspiracies. Life power politics is much more complicated. There's a deep state. There's, you know, black operations uh, and then black operations, you know, start studying black operations. And you start reading, you know, OK, they're covering up like extraterrestrial, you know, crashes like Roswell and other sightings. And, you know, then they've got the secret societies, you know, like the, the going back to, you know, the, obviously the Masons are the big one, but there's many others. Right. And, um, and you start, you know, you start learning this and, and, and then you start to really like your mind, you know, just start to shift in terms of how you see the world. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Tech. Today's guest is filmmaker, actor, author, poet, spiritual seeker, and truth seeker, Sean Stone. A child actor from a young age, Sean featured in his father's films like JFK, The Doors, and Natural Born Killers. His spiritual quest began at 10 years old when his father took him to Tibet, Nepal, and India to illuminate the stark contrast between those worlds and Hollywood. Sean began his own filmmaking career by apprenticing under his father on Alexander and continued to star in multiple films as well as producing documentaries and hosting the reality show Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura, the interview program Buzzsaw, formerly on Gaia TV, and the RT news show Watching the Hawks. Sean is much more than a media host. He has published a cosmic fairy tale, Desiderata by Ali, and released a poetry book, The Ephemeral Shades of Time, which was turned into an album, Alien Spirit, featuring the music of Michael Hugan and available on iTunes and Spotify. He regularly shares his spiritual perspectives and interviews on BU TV, as well as on his Patreon. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. A big thank you to our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley and Organifi, our podcast sponsors, Ned and Wild Pastures, and our preferred product sponsor, Peak Life. Their support is essential in producing this podcast, and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products that they produce. Please check the show notes for links and details. Today's topic of conversation between Paul and Sean is piercing the veils. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D. Today, my guest is Sean Stone. Our title today is Piercing the Veils. I'm super excited to talk to Sean. I've watched countless episodes of his show on Gaia TV, which was called Buzzsaw. And I always loved it because they got into everything. And Sean's got a very inquisitive mind and a very broad depth and scope of knowledge. So I'm excited to talk to him about all sorts of very interesting things today. So Sean, welcome to Living 4D. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. It's a, it's a real great pleasure to have you here. Uh, Sean, based on what I've seen of your work, you have a very diverse background to begin with. I'm sure the listeners would love to learn more about you and get to know you better. So maybe you can share an overview of your background and what shaped you into the person you are today and what your key interests are. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I don't even know where to start. Why don't, you play like, why don't we start with this? Why don't you tell me? What are some of the highlights or things that that intrigue you? I know you mentioned the buzzsaw. So why don't you give me some points? Because there's so many different, I mean, my background, obviously, you know, it's like over, almost 40 years of, of story to tell. So why don't you tell me, why don't you start with some of the highlights that intrigue you and, and we can go into more detail on them? Well, I think it would be interesting to, you know, you, you from watching Buzzsaw, you have obviously got a lot of knowledge in different areas. And you, you know, you know, you seem to me to be a very open mind. Like, you know, you get into, you know, I don't know, you know, they keep changing the name. It was ETs and, and UFOs and now it's you know, unidentified flying. Oh, don't worry about all you. UAPs and all that. It's just, just yeah. I, it's not extra dimensional and extraterrestrial, right? That's all we care about. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> And, and, you know, you're obviously interested in advanced technologies and, and extra dimensions and multi-dimensions. These are all things that I've been very interested in. And, 
I'm a remote viewer and, and do a lot of, you know, deep work and communicate with people in the afterlife and all sorts of stuff that most people think is weird and crazy, but to me is just normal existence. But because of, of, of your background and, and, and the kind of things you get into, I'm just curious, you know, how did you develop your own philosophy? What do you perceive to be, you know, maybe what your sort of spiritual orientation is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for like you said, for you, it's, you know, it's very normal what people consider weird. And for me, it's just normal what people consider weird. I think that they're weird, right? And it's, <laughs> it's very, it's, it's, it's like, it's curious, you know, like there's a new book by Naomi Klein who, you know, did a, did a pretty decent book with uh, years ago on the shock jock, on the shock doctrine. Yeah, I've right? studied and, it. Of Iraq, right? You studied it. And so Klein, you know, she's, you know, she did some good work, you know, in, in that book, but basically has become like a token liberal ever since then. And so she wrote this new thing where she basically is saying that conspiracy theorists and she uses Naomi Wolf as like as the sort of the example of her doppelganger. Right. And Naomi Wolf like epitomizes like where the conspiracy theorists live in this world that they consider like to the to the normal mind. And, you know, it's like the, the world of wacky theories and, you know, weird, weird people. Right. We're all in this doppelganger world, you know, that they can't fathom. And that's where I, I guess I've lived in that doppelganger world like my whole life because I went down the rabbit hole, you know, proverbial rabbit hole when I was like seven years old in a sense. Um, Cause I was in the film JFK and watching that film, watching it being made, what, you know, watching the, the outcome, the product, watching the, the uproar around JFK. And so it's like when you, when you grow up with that, you know, awareness of, Hey, there's like a mainstream perspective that, you know, the Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy and, you know, America's the good guy. And, you know, just whatever you read in your history books is reality. And, you know, whatever you go to school and they teach you, that's reality. And when you, that's like normal. Right. And then when you grow up like I did, where it's just like, no, there are conspiracies. Life power politics is much more complicated. There's a deep state, there's, you know, black operations uh, and then black operations, you know, start studying black operations and you start reading, you know, okay, they're covering up like extraterrestrial, you know, crashes like Roswell and other sightings. And, you know, then they've got the secret societies, you know, like the, the going back to, you know, the, obviously the Masons are the big one, but there's many others, right? And, um, and you start, you know, you start learning this and, and, and then you start to really like your mind, you know, just start to shift in terms of how you see the world, you know, as you're talking about. It's more like, okay, death and birth are just sort of these other dimensions that we're, you know, moving through. And here we are in a, physical body but it's it's still a spiritual experience and you just have a different way of seeing the world so it's difficult to kind of put your finger on when people go like when did you wake up and it was like well i guess you know my first awakening was maybe the film jfk and then like another awakening happened when i was traveling with my dad as like nine to so 10 years old to like india and nepal and tibet and you know seeing the poverty and the death firsthand you know in, in places like india right where people are like you know, kids are dying in the streets and there's such a, a different way of being, but it's also a very spiritual place, right? I mean, the Buddha's the Buddha found enlightenment there in India, and you know, obviously the Tibetans are Buddhists, and they are practicing these meditation practices and going into these altered states, and they utilize their third eye. So I mean, you start you starting to wake up at that age, and then you know, another awakening I think was like, you know, anyway, different points in my life. It was like different awakening moments, moments of awakening, moments of realization. But that's why it's so difficult to see like where did it specifically come from because it came from so many different directions yeah well that's i think life's really that way unless unless you you know believe in all the shit they teach in schools and you know the first thing that happened to me is that pissed me off and i i actually left school i only completed the ninth grade but the first thing that happened well it started happening in church no, no one could answer my questions and then in school every most every time i answered questions i i got pushed off or, you know, it just irritated me. It's like, well, I'm here to learn, but I'm not able to learn anything. I'm not here to, I don't want to memorize shit. I want to ask questions. Mm. And the problem with conspiracy theories, as you well know, as <laughs> soon as you start looking to them, there's piles of evidence. And by definition, a conspiracy is something for which there is no evidence. But, you know, I, I recently saw a book. I can't remember the title of it, but it looked into like a hundred conspiracy theories and every single one of them turned out to be true. And there was piles of evidence for them. And I, th I think the difference is people that are just 
I'll quote David Bohm, and, and, and Bohm and Jung said something that was almost identical. Real thinking is hard work. That's why most people just rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking. <laughs> and I think that's just the fact. And Jung said the average man can never be successful. And, and I think we've got just too much of the population, especially today, that's just too comfortable being lazy enough to look into the things that are very important to look into and the consequences have turned out to be deadly. You know, these are all important things and I think now is no time to be lazy and the word conspiracy theory is usually used to, you know, deface people that are telling a truth that they don't want people to know about and I find that to be, yeah. you know, frankly quite irritating but um, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, come on people, wake the hell up. Well, it's like choose your, I mean, I always love when people, that's a conspiracy theory. I'm like, okay, so Osama bin Laden attacking America on 9-11, that's a conspiracy theory. Russians in, interfering with the election with Donald Trump, that's a conspiracy. Hey, you you can really go through here the nature of, you know, how big tobacco colluded to, you know, basically to, to, to push, you know, to push tobacco knowing that it was, that it was uh, harmful. That's a conspiracy theory. That one may have been, that one actually was proved to some extent in a court of law, right? But again, that was based as a conspiracy theory. And so it's like every time you have a RICO case, whenever the government goes after a mafia component, a drug dealer, uh, anyone, right, on RICO, that's a conspiracy charge. So when the government says it, conspiracy charge, you have no problem with it. No. But when we say the government's involved, oh, you're crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a strange environment. But, you know, that brings up one of my things I, you know, you, you've kind of stimulated me that I want to talk to it and it might be coming up later, but I'll hit it now. I've had many experiences, both in deep meditation and in, in plant medicine ceremonies, where I have found that there are multiple dimensions interpenetrating our dimension. For ex I'm clairvoyant and I, I, I can see people that are on the other side and things like that. And I've had experiences where I was sometimes just sitting here and all of a sudden I would see beings all around me, but they are not in this dimension. Then I would bring my awareness to that dimension and I would be there, but then I would find that in that dimension there's another dimension and there's beings of another type and they're all in the same place meaning mm. like right here in my chair, there's other dimensions. And, and we're mm. almost like, you know, just like you can have, you, we, we can be sitting right here right now and we don't notice that there's radio waves and television waves and all sorts of other dimensions. And like you tune your radio to 98.6 and you pick up a frequency, you tune the dial just a little bit more and it's another complete station with a co totally different environment. You turn on the exactly. television, switch a channel, it's something completely different, but it's all here right now. And I've had very profound experiences where I'm realizing inside of myself through my clairvoyance that I'm actually, we're in kind of like a Russian doll where there's just, I, I think space is really saturated. I think what people call God, you know, they have, I, I, when I use the word God, I mean that for which there is no other. That's mm -hmm. capital G, capital O, capital D. Capital G-O-D as in the Bible, I can define that as the highest power of any belief system. And then little G-O-D I define as any being capable of changing its environment. Mm. So my point is I think mathematically God is a zero or, an inf or infinity. Zero with a twist is infinity and in that God experiences itself in the finite. So the God has to only God God has nothing to look into but itself and it because it's infinite everything that it sees is like its own dream and therefore the dream being looked at becomes finite because there has to be something to look at so if you think of even the electromagnetic spectrum if we just said all these frequencies exist at once and on any one of those frequencies there can be an ex a whole world or a universe Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like everything's interpenetrating. And um, out of curiosity, have you ever studied any of Gene Gebser's work on the structure stages of consciousness? No, I don't think I have. Well, Gene Gebser was a consciousness researcher. I think he probably died in the 60s, but 
he wrote uh, some profound works on consciousness, and he described how consciousness evolves in structure stages, and he, the first level is the archaic, which is basically the consciousness of the earth, of the material realm, and then human consciousness evolves to the magic level, which is where we're in a fusion with nature. Then it goes to the mythic level, and he shows you know, stone carvings and things from ancient sites where often those people drew pictures of human beings with no mouth. And he, was, he shows in his work how we, we weren't using a lot of spoken word. We were more listening and more in touch with everything around us. And we acted more like instead of the animals as being separate from us, we were just one of the beings in nature. And we had to listen more to be aware of what was around us. Then comes the mythical stage where we started telling stories about how we think we got here and what's important and what does lightning mean and what does earthquakes mean and what is life all about and what is birth and what is death. So it goes archaic, magic, mythic. Then it goes to mental. And we're in the mental stage, but he says we're coming out of the mental stage now into the integral stage. And he says in the integral stage, it's quite intense because people start being aware that there's timelines that are constantly interpenetrating. And he describes it as diaphanous or seeing through and that people will begin to realize that all these timelines are converging like we're moving toward a singularity of, of sorts. And it seems to me that um, for people like us that are more open to these realities that you start actually really seeing that there are multiple dimensions interpenetrating and they probably always have been, but we're just, some of us are just awakening to that. And I think there's been a lot of people in the past that have been awakened to that. So that's my long-winded way of saying, what's your thoughts on this potential <laughs> inter interpenetration of potentially infinite dimensions? Uh, well, I don't even know where to start. You, <laughs> you, you bring up so much. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Should we just talk about the machine elves? Do you ever encounter the machine elves on any of your uh, journeys? I have on DMT journeys, yeah. Um, only a couple of times, and I was surprised because I've read a lot of the literature of you know DMT, Strassman, and many other of these type books, and, and, and the machine elves come up a lot for people. But when I've been on DMT ceremonies... I generally find myself moving into the realm of archetypes, a lot, mm. a lot of geometries. Yes, and, yes, I saw that. And archetypes, but but mostly what I've had is just moving into total, oftentimes total union with everything, where I just completely and utterly lose my ego and don't even know if I'm alive or dead. Yes, and then I've gone even further than that, where I, I honestly, I'm not even I'm. I'm I've actually had this experience in Tai Chi where I've gone into a complete non-dual state. One time, just to sort of describe what happened, I was doing Tai Chi out by my water charger, which is a stone structure I build to charge water. I went out there as the sun was going down, and I planned on doing my normal like 20 or 30 minute Tai Chi session that I would do in the evening. I did Tai Chi every day for 18 years and studied with Master Fong Ha, and then all of a sudden, my wife, Angie, comes out looking for me. She you know, says, where are you? You know, dinner's been on the table for a long time and it's cold. And I'd been out there for an hour and 40 minutes and it was pitch black and the grass was all wet. And, and I had this experience of not even knowing, knowing I was alive or dead or even who I was. Yet I'm doing an active form of Tai Chi called the Tai Chi ruler. So I'm moving the whole time. And I've been out there doing this for an hour and 40 minutes, but there was absolutely no experience of me or, or it's like not, not archetypal realms, not geometry. I went right through that into this abyss of silence and emptiness. And there was no subject object reality. There was nothing to report. There was nothing to talk about. So I'm relating that to the DMT experience where I've gone so deep i didn't even know if i was alive or dead or anything and and then i've found myself coming out of it and and really being in a state of 
very deep and profound shock because I'm so far gone that I, I had the experience of like, I don't know which way to direct my consciousness to get home. And it really was uh, the closest I could describe it as, is I felt like I had been sucked into a black hole and didn't know which way to go to get out of the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I came yeah. out of it, you know, when I finally pulled myself back into my body, I was, I was actually pretty freaked out because I wasn't sure if I was alive or not. I was, I had, it took me a minute to really figure out if I was alive. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it, but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will help you to feel your best. To try Paleo Valley's turmeric complex and save 15% on your purchase, go to paleovalley.com forward slash little c, little h, little e, little k15. No promotion code is required. That's paleovalley.com forward slash c-h-e-k-15. No promo code is required. Enjoy the best turmeric complex in the world. Lots of love. I, I have with my DMT, I, I also did a uh, near-death experience, I think you'd say, where we saw the, the light, the realm of light, as you say, it's geometric patterns, right? It was like kind of seeing through the, the matrix. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All symmetry and light, and, and it was just like dying. And as you said, egoless death state. And then came back from that. I never, I never saw the machine elves until I did a boga, and it was weird because I'd heard about the machine elves. It's just this is how consciousness really works, as you were talking about with the many states, dimensionally speaking, right? We are in multiple. We're already operating in multiple, multiple dimensions every moment because we have the the visual plane, right? We have the five the five senses plane of existence, right? But then we have this level of consciousness, right, of awareness that's coming through with our thoughts, visions, moments, right? Little insights glimpses, intuitions, and then you have the unconscious states. So that's already interfacing with us at any moment, which is it's always, it's already multidimensional. But uh, it's in terms of the, the synchronicities, as you know, it's like the universe is communicating to us and it does things in a way that we need to experience it at that moment. So the machine elves was brought up into my consciousness two months before, for the first time, I never heard of machine elves before. And all of a sudden, people are talking about the machine elves, and they're making jokes. The machine elves are racist and this stupid stuff. I don't know. <laughs> and then, and then I do it <laughs> in a boga journey, and um, and all of a sudden, it, it's like I hear this wasp. What sounded like a wasp or a hornet, like mm -hmm. really loud buzzing sound, coming towards me because I'm outside, right, like on the patio doing this journey, and I think like there's some massive bug flying at me, and I look and I'm looking around, and nope. There's nothing there, but I can hear this buzzing. <laughs> and this thing literally sat there for like 12 hours, maybe 16 hours <laughs> buzzing. <laughs> and it was moving. It would move. And they were very funny. There were multiple. They were like uh, all around me during the journey. And they would they would move around. It's like the buzzing would move. Like it was, you know, it was like a, it's like a, it's like a mechanical kind of sound to it. But they were, they described themselves as sort of, you know, is synthetic but organic at the same time organic synthetic merged mm -hmm. you know and they were just like fly around and they would spray me with water you know sometimes like during ceremony um like a shaman will like spray you with water or like blow on you they were doing it <laughs> it was like i was getting sprayed in the face like oh, who just hit me with water <laughs> who just blew me in the face <laughs> they're mach was like, shaman machino yeah basically and they described themselves as sort of I have to look at my notes, but they basically were like, they were like repair. They kind of like 
repair, like they're kind of like running the machinery and the, uh, how do you say it? the, mechan- the machines, I guess, because they're running the machinery of the matrix in a sense, right? Of, of this reality that we say, we, you know, it seems organic, right? The, the, there, is a, there is an organic quality, but because it's all holographic, it's all based on vibrational spins and things like this, right? So yeah. it can actually reconstruct, it could be reconstructed, you know, need be. And, and so they were talking about how they came to fix a hole. They're always here, obviously, but like they, they had to fix a hole in the timeline of 2020 when essentially they said that the, they were t- basically there was a splitting of humanity. A lot of, a lot of us were talking about at the time, the bifurcation of humanity and the idea that basically we were splitting off from each other. And they basically said, well, we had to repair that hole because <laughs> otherwise you guys were going to split. And so they basically helped to bring us back together as, as one humanity going forward, essentially as one humanity, not, not, not separate humanities. I've had a, an experience that I, I've never talked about this experience to anybody, but you've, you've reminded me of it. It's happened several times and it's almost always on deep journeys, which is the kind I prefer to do. I mean, I, I do healing ceremonies. I've done probably four or 500 of them for professional work to help people heal. But in, when I'm in my own ceremonies, I go, you know, very, very deep on really high doses that I wouldn't recommend anybody do. Uh, unless they're very skilled. But in some of these real deep journeys, I've had, I've probably had eight or 10 of these experiences and I always know when they're going to happen. I I will hear the sound of like crickets all around me. And it's, Mm. it's a, it's a, it's not really a cricket. It's the closest sound I can describe, but all of a sudden, you know, this is like three hours in and all of a sudden I hear that it's, it's like crickets are inside of me and around me everywhere And there's these beings that are there when the sound comes. And I said to them, who are you? And they said, we are the crickteries. And I said, oh, my God, you sound like crickets. And so I would have conversations with them, but I never really could see them. There were like beings that were there. I knew they were there. I could feel their presence. I could actually feel them like right there. But usually I can see these beings. But these guys I couldn't see, but they would always show up and then they would start talking to me and I, they would answer my questions. But it was a very, at first it was kind of like an eerie thing because I don't like, I don't like when I can't see a being that's interacting with me because I don't know what they're up to, you know? And, uh, but they were never malevolent or anything. They were always great after, after I realized that they were safe to be around, but then they would show up and I, I always have this profound sense of when they're coming because it sounds like, you know, when you hear a lot of hummingbirds together, how the wings mm-hmm. are very loud and, yes. and these crickeries would show up and it would just be like millions of crickets arriving. So that you just well, reminded they, me of that sort of interesting. They, did they inspire Jiminy Cricket? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, maybe they did. Whoever created Jiminy Cricket was, uh, you know, how he experienced them and he created the character out of it, maybe. Possibly. I mean, you have to you have to wonder with all of these fantastical characters that they're not just, they could be imagined, but they could also have been some level of reality to their, you know, to, to them, their, that experience that generated. Like Robert E. Howard talked about that when he created Conan, right? The original uh, uh, Conan series that he, that Howard said Conan appeared to him. And like, I can't remember if it was like in his study or something. He basically said like, this, this guy just like appeared and was saying, you know, I'm a Sumerian and kind of started giving him the inspiration for, for creating this character. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of people like, I think, wasn't it Lewis Carroll that was in, uh, in using LSD and then inspired uh, his writings? Well, he would have been on mushrooms probably. I don't think they had, cause they didn't, I mean, they technically didn't invent LSD till what 54 or something. Was it like, I thought it was, or, I, th- I thought it was early, early fifties, maybe 47, 48 Albert Hoffman. Yeah. So- yeah, Hoffman at the San- Sandos was the laboratory. Company. Yeah, laboratory. Yeah, it was like late forties, early fifties. But they obviously this if it's if it's from a what does LSD come from a, a mushroom er- or ergot it? rye ergot. the mold of a rye plant. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so so I don't know if Carol would have done LSD, but he certainly could have done some uh, eating some mushrooms. I mean, yeah, that's an ancient ceremony going back, as we now know, thousands of years. Yes. Of, right, of, of initiatory pro- practices using the mushrooms. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Terrence McKenna's book, Food of the Gods, gives us a very unique perspective on 
how he feels mushrooms actually were probably responsible for the rapid expansion of the human brain. There's a lot of people that, you know, argue with that, but I think that's something that's very possible. I mean, you can think of, of us being out in, in the wild and just being hungry and foraging and, you know, you, you eat a mushroom and that's thing you know, you're having a very powerful experience. Yeah. Well, it, that's pretty clear. I mean, that was one of my, that was my first experience with hallucinogens was, um, uh, the mushroom with the ceremony at Oxford, uh, 20, so I was like 20 years old. Yeah. I must've been about 20 years old. And it was kind of one of those interesting little gatherings of about, uh, 200 kids, maybe 300, 200, 200 kids, 300 kids. It was like, we went on a, on buses, you know, a part of this, it was part of an old secret society that, um, I don't know if it was the secret society that still exists or if it was just sort of in spirit. Um, but you know, a few of us were like invited as guests kind of thing. And we went on these buses to this old church outside of Oxford, about an hour outside of Oxford, where underneath the church, the Hellfire Club used to gather. And I'm sure you know the Hellfire Club, right? I haven't heard of it, but I think a church is an interesting place to do a psychedelic journey. (laughs) Well, yeah. So the Hellfire Club was one of these splinter splinters from masonry, um, Ben Franklin, went to get their gatherings when he was in, in England, right? Before the revolution, he was, he was hanging out in England. I can't remember the, all the names of the, of the people, but it was basically, it was an elite club that uh, was involved with all kinds of debauchery. And now when we talk about hedonism and debauchery, I mean, it's like at that time, I mean, sex in general was, you know, this is like, it's not Victorian England, it's pre-Victorian England, but it's, it's still, you know, you don't talk, you don't really, talk about that or engage with that kind of stuff publicly right so i think the hellfires were doing sexual acts and other things but i think there was a darker component to it that uh who knows could have involved sacrifice could have involved pedophilia could have involved blood rituals i mean there's all you you name it right there's yeah that's where these things can go uh so the hellfire club used to do their rituals under the church in these caves and the caves have been preserved sort of to (laughs) to in memory of the hellfires and uh, we went down there and had a rave. Basically, everyone in order to enter had to take a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really fascinating to me. The, the experience was just like so elucidating as far as just understanding the control mechanisms. I mean, that was my first experience, right? And it was like it was kind of communicating to see how we are consciousness is connected at that subcellular level in a sense, right? So we're, like you were saying, like things can be happening you know, right here in the same space, but because it's a different dimension, you don't see it. And so much of what we call God is not what's out there. It's right. What's in here, what's in our own bodies, you know, the information, the activation within our own bodies, as you know, when you start to go into that state of an altered state, like your body is responding, yeah. right. And how you is reacting to this, to these chemicals and to the consciousness that's being released through your whole body, through the DNA and you, you know, right. That's, that's, that's inside of you. That's, all through your DNA is all through your body. Mm-hmm. So if that connects, communicates to God, then that information is all through us. It's not just up here in the brain or out there. It's right in here. And then, yeah, I mean, just the, the, the nature of how the control mechanisms work as far as understanding the nature of controlling humans using very primal things like uh, cocaine, sex, the, the lower chakra, basically the sexual drive, right? The, um, the ability to marionette people using the control of the third eye through the through the media and the things that we that, pe- that people consume right through their through their eyes and essentially and through their consciousness their third eye being programmed it was really it was like a very fascinating experience of le- of just watching like okay yeah okay I get it I get the game okay this is a game <laughs> this it is, is it is a very going powerful on game. down here right? yeah. Uh, planet of the apes down here you know <laughs> are the apes evolving are they learning or are they you know are they growing in consciousness or are they just stuck in that reptilian brain stand and that you know basically that that chakra system has, has basically been shut down and puppeteered basically are you being puppeteered yes or are you actually to control your own kundalini to control your own system to become the master of your own vessel that's really the galactic challenge i think of, of what what we're why god incarnated at through us right through us God knowing itself through this experience, right? Yes. To say, okay, can you overcome this challenge? Can you overcome this manipulation to actually stand in your own sovereignty, to to control your own vessel, to become the captain of your own soul? 
Hi, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the show. I thought I'd take a minute to sing you a little song. Dr. Quiet, she is yin. Know how she loves to bring energy in. She teaches you how to rest so your energy is always at its best. Hey! And I want to tell you a little secret. You know how I support Dr. Quiet? I use Organifi Gold, and it does some magic to help you sleep deeper and restore better so you can get up and be a freedom fighter first thing in the morning and all through the day. And I got Drew Canoli, who created the product right here, right now, to tell us why it works so well. Drew, what's so unique about Organifi Gold except the fact that my kids won't stop asking for it? I love this song. Thank you. And I think if we were DJing this, we would do Rishi. Because <laughs> Rishi, uh. full spectrum, eight to one, yeah. beta glucans, knock you out. The queen of mushroom. Rishi is one of the most powerful things we can put in our body, especially at night. Helps restore, revitalize, great for the liver. Yeah. So while we sleep, not only are we restoring and repairing the cells, but we're detoxing in the most effective way possible. Yes. And it doesn't have to taste bad. In fact, it could be something you crave. Yeah. And that's Organifi Gold. It tastes like Autumn had a baby with a marshmallow. Every time I have it, it just knocks me out. I've literally tracked it with my Whoop, my Aura Ring, yeah. and it adds another hour to an hour and a half of deep sleep. That's great. Ram and deep every single night. You know what's also really cool? Rishi is a wise man. Mm. It's not only the name of a mushroom, but a Rishi is a wise man. Oh, true story. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's absolutely true. I'm not so, pulling your leg. And how much wisdom have you and I gained from night school? A Dream lot time. of wisdom. Yep. Yes, and you gain a lot when you can't sleep. You go, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and how do I get it fixed up? <laughs> so, hey, you know, one time when I was visiting you at your house, you made me a gold, Organifi Gold as a hot tea, and I'd never realized you could make it hot. It's the best way. And I was like blown away. I'm like, wow, this is incredibly good. It tastes like dessert. Mm -hmm. But it, unlike most sweet things, if you take sweet stuff at night you can't sleep very well and it jacks you up but this stuff was just so relaxing and so amazing i was like wow this is incredible and i know you're allergic to coconut yeah right so but what i like to do and this is when i'm being bad you see there's a much bigger cannoli than the cannoli you see today I, I would eat ice cream and all kinds of comfort food because i'm from michigan uh -huh. but one thing that put my cravings in check i take a little cocoa whip yeah. I put it on top of this oh, that's golden nice. tea okay it is the best drink yeah. at night you could ever have it's amazing yeah. I'm intolerant. I'm not allergic. So I did That's try it, it. It just makes me feel stressed. But I found that, you know, if I don't overdo it, I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to have everybody try Organifi Gold because we all need to sleep deep and pay attention to what our soul tells us while we dream so we can work together to mm. make this world a beautiful place for everybody and get our freedom back and get rid of the toxins in the government and other things we need to do. And now, for a limited time, Organifi Gold Pumpkin Spice is back. All the goodness of regular Organifi Gold with the flavors of fall, pumpkin, cinnamon, nutmeg, and allspice. Go to Organifi.com forward slash check 20 and use the code check 20 to get 20% off your order of Organifi Gold Pumpkin Spice. That's Organifi.com forward slash check 20 and the code is CHEK20 to get 20% off your order. Sleep well. A couple of things that you've triggered to me to want to bring onto the table you know, in my own spiritual research, looking at all the DNA research, and then, you know, the first thing that struck me was when they talked about such a, the majority of the DNA is what they call junk DNA. And I'm like, immediately, that's bullshit. You know, the unit, nature does not put thousands of strands of DNA in you that are junk. And so, the way I do a lot of these investigations is I've developed a deep relationship with my soul. And so I say to my soul, you know, what, 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 there's no way this junk DNA is junk. What's going on? And my soul says, that's not junk. That is a record of the entire history of the evolution of nature itself. And that just like we have like 19% of the same genes as a, a daffodil or 23% of the same genes as a banana, and, you know, we have a lot of the same, we have genes in common with almost everything out there. And so my soul said, no, you have access to every single thing in the history of evolution on this earth. That is what they call junk DNA. 
And so what I found is that the DNA is actually a, a very, very comprehensive antenna system that connects us to a vast uh, number of frequencies from the archaic mineral dimension to the plant kingdom, to the animal kingdom, all the way up through the human and, and even beyond. In fact, I'm quite confident that the DNA antenna system can actually connect us to probably a vast range of frequencies that we haven't even become conscious of yet that we are accessing until you get into some of the experiences we're talking about and all of a sudden you realize things like the interpenetration of dimensions and 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 you know when when you study what human beings have experienced and recorded and you know um did you ever study stalking the wild pendulum by Itzhak Bentov or any of his work no i'm not familiar with him man you got to get your hands on Stalking the Wild Pendulum by Itzhak Bentov. He invented the pacemaker. He was the first one to do scientific research on meditation. He was a very profound guy. He was a remote viewer. He identified what the rings of Saturn were before uh, NASA had actually figured out what they were. And he told one of his friends at NASA, because the guy said to him, you know, we're trying to figure out what these rings are. And he remote viewed and told him exactly what they were. And that's exactly what they turned out to be. But in his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, he has a diagram showing the range of human consciousness, and it's extremely vast. But uh, so anyhow, my comment there was just, I think the DNA is a very, very comprehensive, almost cosmic antenna system that allows us to, once we become more conscious of how we can use our consciousness, you know, energy flows in line with our awareness. And once you direct your awareness to anything, I mean, I, as a remote viewer, I can go anywhere. All I got to do is put my mind there. And what, are that, what does that tell you? It tells you you can't be separate from everything. You know, how could I be sitting in the chair and be walking around on the sun if I was separate from the sun? There's no way that's possible. But the, the question I wanted to ask you, because I think it's an interesting one at this point in our conversation, is where do you feel human beings fit into this grand scheme of things, be it from a matrix perspective, the game perspective, the simulated reality perspective, God, yeah. you know, it's, it's like we, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question to say like, where do we fit into this? You know, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. <laughs> yeah. It's such an interesting question because going back to what we were talking, what you were just saying in terms of how can you see something? How can something be in your consciousness if it's separate from you? Yeah. Right. This is something that came through a few years ago and people don't like to hear it because they think it's new age or whatever. But I said, there is no external reality. And it's not about the new age concept of like, it's I'm the only one in existence. It's that there is only oneness. Yeah. And in order to experience it through this vessel, I can only experience it through my vessel of, of, of reality, right? My experience of consciousness. And so everything that we're experiencing essentially is within the domain of consciousness, which is the oneness. So if we think about going back to like you, you were saying the, the Russian dolls or the, you know, the oneness of God, it's like, unless you just want to be stagnant as a zero point stack, you know, basically as a zero sum stagnation, right? It could be, it can be infinite, but it would just be, let's say a black hole or nothingness. If it wants to actually create and move and be something, there has to be movement, which creates separation, right? Or creates change, mm -hmm. right? The universe, it's like it's the universe that desires change, that, desi that desires to distinguish itself and to know itself better. But in order to know yourself better, there has to be contrast. You can't know yourself if there's no contrast. So the way I see it is the oneness of creation splintering itself. But even within our own, our own body, it's a great model. You know, within our own body, it's still one body, but every cell is still a distinct cell. Yeah. And so what if every person is like a cell within the body that is God? And so there are going to be things that are foreign to the cell that we want to protect and fight against, right? And be like, oh, that's hostile. But that, that which seems hostile is also challenging, which also is transforming you. And so I see this all as the transformation of... The human, yeah, right. This is this is an ev it's an evolutionary planet, and it's also the transformation of consciousness reaching towards, as you said, like uh, you were citing someone who talked. Uh, was it Gebser? I think you said who 
refers to this idea of a singularity point. And that's what I'm really curious about. Because some, okay, let's say like, you know, you're like someone like Gebser and you have this awareness of a singularity point that consciousness is reaching towards, but you don't get to live to see it. Or does he? Where does he go if he's recognized that singularity moment, but he's not here for it? Or is he here for it? Where is he in? Where is he gone? Yeah. To experience this. We were all approaching and we, I think we're sensitive to something. He's like, there is like an event horizon. I don't know. I feel it deeply. Like there's something that, that's trend, like, that's going to transform everything because the way that this this game has been played and is going, it's like we become too aware of it in a sense to to let it stay the same. Mm-hmm. If it just continues with this same game of deep state manipulation, Federal Reserve uh, printing of money, you know, inflationary uh, tendencies, just control of you know control of the human using these antiquated concepts and belief systems, right? It's boring. We don't want to see the Roman Empire 2.0. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to see a 10.0. 0. <laughs> right or 10.0 we don't want to see babylon we want to see something new that's where i think that's on the other side of the event horizon yeah it's like a new way of being and living in this world like we haven't seen for ten thousand years or more on this planet that's what i think we're going towards yes i the way i you know just in response to your thoughts there i'll try to state this in a way that that is followable but to me, God symbolically can only be represented as a zero. And when you think of measuring an, a frequency, if you look at an electroencephalogram or, or an electrocardiogram um, uh, or uh, an oscilloscope, you always have a zero reference line. If someone dies, they flatline. So we say there's zero activity there. There's no consciousness there. There's no life there. So if you think of zero as the reference line for all frequencies, and we know from from quantum physics and physics that everything in the universe is basically boils down to energy and information. And Bentov said consciousness has to have three things, space, time, and movement. So when you think that if God is the zero reference line, I describe to my students, I say, think of God as a dance floor. If you were a dance floor, could anybody dance on the floor without you knowing about it? Everyone says no. Could a mosquito walk on you without you knowing about it? No. There's nothing that you would not know about because you are the dance floor. So the zero reference line represents the source of what I call big C or the consciousness that we would think of as the witness within ourselves. But the phenomena, which you could say that like the foam of the zero point field, which which is what's creating everything, that's the transition point between Bohm's implicate domain and the explicate domain, where you have measurable, tangible phenomenon. So God is kind of like the dance floor or the zero point, but God can only experience itself by dreaming itself into existence because mind is a duality and God is a unity or a singularity or, you know, uh, in Tantra, uh, you know, the not a Bindu point is the beginning of anything, the seed of everything. So if you think that God can only experience itself by dreaming itself into existence, and once you have characters in a dream that begin to share energy and information, now you have the qualities of mind and you also have the basis for love because mind and love both require relationship. So if If love and mind both require relationship and to be conscious of them, you have to have space, time, and movement, but the source of that is zero, then ultimately everything that exists is God experiencing itself and the characters awaken in the dream and become co-creators in the dream, but they don't realize that their consciousness is minded by big C. In other words, the subject in you is the subject in me. And the objects that we are experiencing in our consciousness, be it our own thoughts or what we're listening to or the chair you're sitting in, they're actually the objects that are produced by the subject dreaming, but we think of them as objects outside of us because the subject is, is intangible to us. You can't, you, you know, that's why it's subject. You can't measure it. That's why this problem of trying to figure out what consciousness is, well, it's consciousness looking at itself and everything you produce is a phenomenon that requires space, time, and movement, but you, you fall into the trap of not realizing that it's the zero reference line or big C that's dreaming itself into existence. So it's, 
it's really quite a, a magical, mysterious situation that's going on. And, and I can't remember what the direction I was going to, for, to tell you that, but I think what I'm saying is ultimately that everything that's happening is part of the one God and that all of us are really expressions of the divine exploring its own potentials and then experiencing that because there's nothing, there's nobody there to experience it but God itself, which is actually the subject in all of us projecting objects in order to have a dreamlike experience. And within that comes the relationships. For, for example, if let's just say you and I were having this meeting right now but we were doing it in a dream and we were dreaming that we were having this meeting, which could very well be what's going on. We can't really prove that we're not having this dream at some level. But as soon as you and I recognize, oh, Sean, hey, how you doing? Paul, how you doing? Now there's an exchange of energy and information between two points, which is what it takes to make a mind. So all of a sudden we go from dreaming, zero, the unity of it all is the one within which you have the subject-object relationship, now you have mind. Point being is that we get into our mind and we forget that we're dreaming and we forget that the subject is what's producing the object of Sean. In other words, Sean is just another expression of God and so is Paul, but they're both the same thing. And so mind actually becomes sort of this tool that it also becomes the barrier because it's very hard to get behind mind until you get deep enough into the practice of observing no mind states. And I think that's what plant medicines do and you know, psychedelics, they, they basically dissolve the ego and all of a sudden you're, you're just swimming in this flow of the massive amount of information that is flowing within the dream that, that I'm saying that God is having. So anyhow, that's just a concept. I don't know, you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really just different energy states, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's all of existence. It's just different energy states. It is. And the problem is that we get into this, this notion of, you know, materiality and, and we think of this as the end all be all, which is, which is the greatest illusion, the greatest joke ever played because materiality is, is not fixed. You know, every moment it's like it, it, this body is, is, is in motion. The energy in it is in motion. It's, it, everything inside of it is in motion, but we get, we get fixed on these ideas of like trying to uh, permanence and trying to hold on to materialism. And that's why I think so much of our, our reality is, is subject to this, this type of manipulation and, you know, false ego power struggles, right? Because these beings that are control freaks are trying to hold on to things uh, that you can't hold on to in the material realm. It's, it's impossible. Hi guys, Paul here. Forgive me for interrupting this amazing podcast, but I do have something to share that I think you'll all want to know about. Check Inside is a free education jackpot you do not want to miss out on. Would you like a free tour inside the world's most holistic education system? I would imagine you would. Check Inside offers anyone the opportunity to take sample lessons from all of our online courses. It's a great way for health and fitness professionals to preview our courses and to add to their knowledge and coaching skills and toolkit. Check Inside is free for everyone. Check Inside provides access to these lessons through November 27th on our e-learning platform. Participants will be able to select lessons from our online courses, including Integrated Movement Science 1, which is also online, and Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2 online, which is our professional course for training professional holistic lifestyle coaches. You'll learn techniques like squat assessment, pec minor assessment and stretching techniques, and the Swiss ball hip flexor stretch. You'll add to your knowledge base with in-depth lectures on topics such as muscle sling systems, cortisol, fascia and water, and the triune brain. Check Inside participants can also add the courses they like to a wish list for Black Friday sales where they can save up to 30% on courses of their choice. Check Inside is open now. To register, go to C-H-E-K dot group, G-R-O-U-P, forward slash inside. That's C-H-E-K dot group forward slash Inside, I have put my heart and soul into all Czech Institute education and the Czech Academy, and now is your chance to take advantage of my life's work for free. 
Share it with anyone you know that wants authentic, no BS health and fitness wisdom that can help you look, feel, and perform and live more fully. Once again, that's check, C-H-E-K, dot group, forward slash, inside. Enjoy. Check inside. You see, if we all knew we were, shall we say, God dreaming, and that became too conscious, we might not take it so seriously. It would be like, oh, we're just playing another damn video game. Right. But, right. but when you fall into it, you know, one of the visions I've had, because I do a lot of spiritual research on this, I've had this vision. I, I want to share it with you because I, th- I want to I see what you think about it. I had this vision of God as a little child, but a genius. And the child's favorite thing to do is make what we would call a video game And then God says to itself, now I'm going to jump into the video game. And the only way I can get out is if I win the game. And only then Mm. when God wins the game, does God go, oh, I did it. I did it. I made it. But that's what causes time and space. And think of it. If, you know, I've, I've toyed with this. It look, if, if, if you like you and I are in physical bodies, you know, we're at a distance seeing each other on a camera. But if you actually, if I could raise your vibration to that of light and put you into a video game where all the other characters were also made of light, they would seem just as material to you as a light character as you might seem standing next to me here. So if you can imagine God's creating this amazing video game and says, I'm going to dive into this thing. I'm going to make all these characters. And the only way to get out of it is to win it. And I got nothing else to do. I got all the time there ever is and will be. So why not? And in order order to make it, it has to be an aspect of you because you can't create that, which is not an extension of you. It is, right? Point I'm driving at, though, is the materiality of it makes it seem very, very real. And if you look at the, the alchemists really said... Spirit is caught in matter, and the function of alchemy is to liberate spirit from matter. And when you liberate, then you really become free, and, and, and there's the dragon getting out of the game. Like, I won it, you know? So I, I, I keep, I've had this vision many times, very profoundly, that we're all God dreaming itself up in this game-like reality, but matter is what encases us in it to make it seem so real that you can actually get trapped in it. And God doesn't care if you get trapped in it for a million lifetimes, because what the hell else is there to do? It's just all a big, (laughs) it's just a big self-exploration. So anyhow, I was just curious what you thought of that concept. (laughs) Exactly. And this is also why it's talking about the releasing of, of uh, the spirit from matter. I mean, that's why the nuclear bomb was this alchemical explosion, essentially, (laughs) right? Of, Of literally of, opening uh, gateways into, you know, potentially, you know, of other other worlds into this, into our world, you know, basically uh, saying, okay, well, now we've completely, we've cracked the, the the fundamentals of this universe, right? We've cracked it open. <laughs> yeah, so, we did. Right? And so um, there's, you know, there's an interesting question to me that came through energetically the last couple of years was because the earth is on an ascension period now where it's, it, it feels that we are rising. The Earth's uh, vibration is rising. It's transforming, and people will mistake that for global warming. It's it's just it's simply the the the, the actual activation of Earth herself being active, and she's like she's like Sleeping Beauty, and the Sun is basically playing its role of helping. It, as the Sun itself, talk about nuclear bombs and whatnot, is a portal, right? It's a doorway, and it's helping to really activate the Earth's uh, awakening process. And since we are made of the Earth, we are awakening too. Right? Yes, it's all connected. So. I was thinking, well, if we're on an ascension time period, I think there's a lot of lower, lower, lower density beings. We call demonic beings, or just low, low frequency, low vibration, low density beings that are trying to hook in and ride the ascension process. And I think that's what you're seeing too. Is a lot of like heavy, dark stuff. The last couple of few years has been trying to like latch on, especially you know towards the end. I mean, this is like this is really the end of this this cycle. Like we approach that singularity we were talking about, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is going to going to this ascension process is going to shake off that which is not ready for a true ascension. Yeah. So in in back to the sort of the question, where do you think humans fit in? You know, I'm 
like uh, having studied Steiner's work quite, quite a, a lot and studied shamanism, my wife, Angie, I have two wives. You met Penny. Angie's a very highly trained shaman. And so in shamanism, you know, they have the upper world, the lower world, and the middle world. But I did a diagram for my students with, based on the chakra system, and I sh said that the upper three chakras represent the angelic realm or higher vibrational dimensions and the creative beings that Steiner says actually create us and infuse themselves into us. And then the middle, you have the heart, which is the integration. And then below it, you have the material realm, which is the animal, plant, mineral kingdom. And so it seems to me that we're sort of right in the middle of these dimensions. And there's many books I've read that says, in paraphrase, they say the angels have great respect for human beings because they're caught in these intense polarities. And so the, they're, they're like enamored by, wow, you really want to do that? Well, yeah. we'll help you out because you're going on a tough journey down there. From my own conception, I, I, I think we're kind of right in the middle. We're right. We got matter beneath us. We got spirit ab above us and, and higher dimensional beings. And then we're stuck right in the middle where we're having this polarity, you know? Yeah, we're in the heart. That's why Earth Earth is heart. I mean, look at the look at the spelling of Earth. You can't. It's the same letters for a reason. So Earth is the heart domain. Yes. And, and people can 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 avoid it, you know, as long as you like you said, as long as you want, you can come back lifetime after lifetime. Sooner or later, you're going to realize it's about love, right? You can have all, all the toys, you can have all the experiences. If you don't have love, then it doesn't mean anything. How empty is it? Yeah. And heart, I think heart has the same letters as hearth, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And hearth, the hearth, isn't that where you, you the home, put? Like the, the warmth of the home, right? The hearth is like the center of the home. Yes. It's it's kind of like where you, we, you know, the hearth is where you put, almost like where you put a, a, a um, the furnace your altar, the your oh, altar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like where you put, like I have a fireplace behind me, but I have it covered in all my, pictures of my favorite gurus and, and gemstones and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, things that are important to me spiritually, because they remind me to remember who I am every day and not get caught in silliness, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I just, I was just curious where you thought we fit, but it sounds like we sort of agree that we're in the middle of it all. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, this is, it's an evolutionary planet. So you know, the human is here for this experience of, of evolving. I look at it very much as we, we are going back to, you said, piercing the veil. Well, Percival, Percival, who is the character that finds the Holy Grail, Percival literally means piercing the veil. Yeah, and, well, that's uh, interesting, yeah. And the Grail is, the, is basically it's love, right? Like being It is love, yeah. To be blind, you know, Percival also means pure fool. Uh -huh. uh, and so he's both piercing the veil, but he's also the pure fool. How do you... How do you pierce the veil? You have to be blind because if you if you think you know, if you see too much, you're going to expect, right? You're going to think, you know, you're going to expect this outcome. You're going to think you know, as opposed to when you're blinded and you're just, it's like uh, when Luke Skywalker is learning to use the force, right? They blind him. It's like, okay, now you're just learning to use the intuition. Now you're learning to, to, to work with, with your senses, with your heart, with your energy. And, yeah. And so we are here basically with this journey of, hey, the angels might be there, the, the aliens might be there, God might be there, but guess what? They're not sitting there when you wake up saying, okay, go brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> now go do this. They're not yeah. going to do that. You got you to figure that out. You got to figure it out for yourself. And so what's funny to me is this journey of, of sovereignty that so many, I think so many people are being called to now in this time period. Is the ascent is the for the ascension is basically to say okay now you're standing up from the child, the archetype of the child because that's what humans have been. Yes, think they about, have. Think about the nature of how we've lived for thousands of years, like with these kind of feudal states of you know servitude, and it, whether or not you could say like it's manipulation, but there's there, everything is co-created for a reason, right? Humans at that time were basically they had to experience certain things, so they go through those periods of feudalism, and subjugation, and deprivation. And, you know, an austere, you know, all these things. And now it's like, okay, are you still sitting here waiting for the government to tell you what to do guys? And that, that's where the 2020 was like that, that real checkpoint. It was like, okay, yeah. who's ready to proceed and to be a sovereign being and to, to, to think and, and feel and, 
perceive with your own mind and who's sitting there going, the government said to stay in my room. So I'm staying in my room. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Brian Rose and his podcast, London real. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He interviewed me uh, probably in the first year early in, in the, in the whole pandemic. And he, said, what do you think's really going on? And I said, I think we're going through a legitimate initiation, a rite of passage. I said, every native culture had a rite of passage. The women have it through the birthing process, but men had to get the child knocked out of them. So they got clear on what they were protecting. They had to protect life. They had to protect their tribe. They had to be ready to give their life to protect that, which is, you know, what supports life itself. And I said, you know, we've all been stuck in this sort of childlike relationship with agencies and religions and on it goes. And I said, now we have are in a situation where these so-called overlords are just getting greedy and, and too full of themselves. And, and ultimately that's for us to take our dominion back, take our sovereignty back. And I said, you know, uh, the problem with an initiation is that they're real and people die in them all the time. I mean, the, the natives knew that you had to face death and it couldn't be just fake. It had to be real. And a lot of them, if you didn't pass your trial, they would kill you because they couldn't carry more children in a tribe. It's, it's, they couldn't feed them all. You know, you had to be a contributing member to a tribe or the tribe would cease to exist. And so I really feel that we're all going through a legitimate rite of passage into adulthood, which means to know what life is and know what you're here to protect. And I think we've gotten so far from our relationship with the earth. I personally feel the earth from my own experience is a living being. She, yeah. she is really in many ways our mother and she's here to sacrifice herself, but she can't carry any more children because children with, with advanced toys can be very destructive and we're killing mother. And I think this she's devoted herself to the evolution of souls and and when this when the when the teenagers and their toys start damaging the planet to where it can't be used to help other souls evolve then she she has to create a situation where the children have to go through a real rite of passage which literally is for her own survival so that she can continue to do her work as a mother of souls and so you know my my point is just that I really believe all this is a legitimate rite of passage. And I also think we're all on the hero's journey, whether we realize it or not. And, and if you keep negating, if you keep saying no to the hero's journey, then inevitably the ordeal will consume you. Yeah. Right. There's a real, there's a real archetypal mythological reality to the hero's journey. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, um, but again, it's, it, but the, the, there's also, I've always thought about that, the hero's journey, but is the female journey the same as the male's hero's journey or is the female version different? Well, I think the female's hero's journey is, is very much the same in the context of having to deal with the risk of death and a lot of pain. I mean, uh, I don't know if you've been there with a woman having going through the birthing process and even carrying the baby and, and, you know, all the body weight gain and the, you know, like my, my wife, Angie gained, God, she, she went from 123 to over 180 pounds. She's only five foot one. She could barely walk her, our second child. She had 36 hours of very intense labor. My first child with my first wife was 72 hours. And I'm like, God, I don't know how in the freaking hell a woman can handle this shit. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I was just there to support her and to be with her for 72 hours straight, you know, rubbing and squeezing and responding. And it's just like, wow, you know, I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. It was tougher than going through jump school and all, all that stuff. And a lot of women die in the birthing process. And then the, the demands of the first year, a woman's brain shrinks one centimeter from sleep, sleep deprivation. So you're talking about a very legitimate hero, uh, hero's journey and rite of passage and the sacrifice of herself for the child. I mean, she's got to give everything to that child. She's giving her whole body to that child. And then there's the, the, the if that's not enough, the, then there's a lot of the complications that occur in relationships because the stress of that makes it very hard for 
men to really understand women. So there's a lot of fighting and a lot of confusion, a lot of relationships break down during that first year that a child's born because the men just don't understand the women and the women don't get enough support of men. In fact, I don't know if you know this, Sean, but did you know that the sweat lodge was created by Native American elders in the matriarchal period because they realized men did not appreciate what a woman had to go through in her rite of passage. So the sweat lodge is actually a replication of the womb, the uterus, yeah. and the heat is for a man to have to experience the intensity of the three trimesters plus the birthing process. So you got four rounds in the, in the sweat lodge, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and the last one, which is the toughest to get through, is the birthing process. So they developed this ceremony specifically to train men to have a deeper understanding of the trials of a woman. So my answer is yes, I think women are on the hero's journey. And I think whether a woman has a baby or not, just the challenges of relationships, not only with mother and with other women, but with men. I mean, I tell people all the time, you don't need a friggin' church. All you got to do is be in a committed relationship and everything you need to become enlightened is right there in the relationship. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I bet you're like most people out there and you have a hard time getting a deep, restful sleep consistently and regularly. And I'm one of those guys, not because there's anything wrong with me, but because I got so much going on and I'm trying to do so much in the world and I'm so passionate about things, I can't seem to stop creating at night. So sometimes I need a sleep aid and I've just had a really hard time finding a good one until now. I came across Ned's sleep formula and wow, has it been helpful and it is super high quality, so high quality. I wanted to make sure you guys knew about it and could try it out. So I've got Adrian, the co-founder and one of the formulators for Ned to tell us more about how this amazing product works and why it is so unique. So Adrian, dial us in on this amazing product you guys have created. Yeah, well, I don't know about you, Paul, but man, is it hard to have a good day after a bad night's sleep. Amen. Sleep is literally the number one thing we can do to take care of ourselves. Yet so many of us experience issues falling asleep, staying asleep, or both. Yes. Our research showed us that most sleep aids, whether pharmaceutical or even the quote-unquote natural solutions like melatonin, actually disrupt circadian rhythm and perpetuate sleep issues in the long run. And that's not even mentioning some of the addictive nature of these things and the long list of side effects from these conventional solutions. So that's when we got together with our expert team of formulators to craft what we consider the ultimate natural alternative to conventional sleep aids that really is aimed to give us better days after better nights. So it has become our all-time best-selling product. We call it Ned Sleep Blend. It features organic full-spectrum hemp and organic botanicals like lemon balm, passion flower, and skullcap all sourced through our Farm to Net Alliance, which we designed to procure the best botanical ingredients available that actually work, while also supporting independent, organic, regenerative farmers across America. And thank you for that. That's important. Yeah, so important. And it also includes a little recognized but powerful minor cannabinoid called CBN that is being recognized as one of the most effective natural sedative compounds available. So all these elements combined means you sleep deeper, longer, and wake up refreshed, all without the nasty side effects. So it's available in both tincture and vegan capsules. All you have to do is go to helloned.com and use the code CHEK, that's C-H-E-K, to get 15% off your first purchase. Plus, every order is backed by our 60-day stress-free guarantee. So if you don't feel a significant improvement in your sleep, We'll give you your money back, no questions asked. Awesome. I can't wait for you guys to try it. I absolutely love the stuff. I'm super excited to be able to share this product with you. So give it a try. A question that popped into my head, because I'm a practitioner of tarot and I teach tarot workshops and I've studied tarot for many years. I think the tarot archetypes are freaking bang on. I mean, when you talk about the hero's journey, the life process, spiritual evolution, the archetypes of the tarot, in, in my opinion, have really got it. I mean, there's like 
when you look at the major arcana that starts with the fool and ends with the world, it's a real story that is playing itself out, not only in our consciousness, but in the reality all around us every day. And having been a practitioner of tarot for many, many years, I've probably, I'm on my 14th notebook of my daily tarot draws, and I analyze how each day when I come to work, I get up at 3.30 in the morning, and I look at my previous day's draw, and I look at how it played out. And it's boggling to the mind to see how all these things play out. And I'll give you an example of something I've done a thousand times that blows my mind. I'll be reading a passage in a book, and it could be a profound, maybe Joseph Campbell or somebody really profound or anything. And I'll say, wow, that, that is, that's talking about death. That's tarot number 13. And I look at the page number, do the numerology, and almost every time, the concept of what the author is talking about from an archetypal typo perspective turns out to be exactly the numerology of the page in the book. Mm. And so I, you, you know, there's many ways you can see how the matrix is coded. Yeah. And I start tracking all these archetypes and, and doing the numerology on them. And it's like, it's everywhere. Or you'll be sitting there reading a book. You'll think, Oh my God, that's tarot 13. And it'll, it'll, it'll be one thirteen on the clock. You know, what's September 13th today? <laughs> ah, wow. Uh, it, it is. Wow. And I didn't even realize that. That's crazy uh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just wondering what you thought of tarot or what your experience of it was. I don't have a particular perception on tarot. I would say that uh, Elifus Levy kind of has a similar philosophy to you that you could basically learn the fundamental philosophy of life through it. I, I am all about, as I said, synchronicities and being able to draw from anything. You know, it can be yeah. throw, like it can be literally like picking up the, a book you feel called to pick up and opening the page, and it can have an answer for you at that moment or lead you somewhere at that moment. It can be an, in, an email popping in. It can be uh, the synchronicity of thinking of someone and they like, reach out to you. I mean, there's so many there's so many moments right that align that remind you of the align, uh, alignment. So. Yeah, I don't have a particular relationship with Tyrone, but I do acknowledge that when it comes to, to helping to be reflected back to us, right, where we are on our journey, it, it can certainly help to pull a card from the deck and it can also be an Oracle deck. Uh, that's something I want to put out uh, either later this year or the next year. I'd love to get up my uh, uh, wisdom deck that I created. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, very, I'm a big believer in just having things to give us like little reflections and you know with those moments we don't you know we need we need a little guidance we need a little reminder right yes uh, we all do you know it can just be silly stuff it can just be like hey just breathe you got this yeah oh, thank you for reminding me okay <laughs> right because we need, going back to the whole concept of god knowing itself through separation because if, if, if it's just the monologue and it's just us saying to ourselves hey i'm you know i'm great i get i'm good i've I'm in my power. It's like, that's, that, that's wonderful to have that confidence, but we come here for, for, a, for a relationship, right? That's part of going back to the heart, right? We need, we need relationship. It's not just about being good and honoring ourselves and loving ourselves, but it's also in relationship. As you just said, if, if you're in relationship, you learn so much about where you are, what's, you know, where your weaknesses are, what you can work on for emotional intelligence and uh, sensitivity, uh, just growing as, as, a, as a better person, right? Any relationship will, will help you to be a better person if you, if you stick it out. Well, you know, interestingly, you cannot know yourself without relationships. I mean, think about it. If you, if you could somehow have been placed as a child on an island on which there was nobody else, you would never know who you were. Without relationships, we never actually learn about ourselves, nor do we nor does anybody else, you know, who would tell us whether we were, we, whether we were being disrespectful or who would tell us whether we were intelligent or beautiful or where we could learn or where we could grow. I mean, think of what the ego is, is a creation. It's, it's a really, a, it's, a, it's a nexus of ideas that have been passed into us from other people. I say to my students, of all the thoughts that run through your mind, 
What percentage of them, if you an analyze them, if I could put your mind into a supercomputer and process everything that makes up your ego as thoughts and ideas and beliefs, what percentage of those would be actual novel thoughts and creations of your own? Mm. And most of my students think about it and they say the most common answer is somewhere between none and 2%. I say it, probably a genius might have more than 2%. But when you really think about it, your mind is like a computer that's been programmed, but you're so used to it, that you just keep drawing programs in from outside. Like I watch Buzzsaw, I get an idea, and that triggers another idea, and I think, oh, that might be mine, but I forgot I actually learned that from Sean Stone on Buzzsaw or his guest. And so when you, when you come to the realization that we actually cannot know ourselves through relationship, and relationship is the verb of love. Without relationship, love has no agency. Yes. So we're we're really in a nexus of relationship, which is God relating to itself for the same reason. God can't know itself without love and relationship. So it's really quite a beautiful paradoxical situation we've got ourselves in. We're like in a Mexican finger trap. The harder you try to get out, <laughs> the more you get stuck in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when it comes to, as you said, you know, the 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 thing, the ideas, the thoughts. I mean, those of us that are doing creative work, as you know, like you're writing, whether you're writing a book, whether you're painting, whether you're uh, making music, poetry, making music, right? It's like you realize more. I, I've always realized this. I don't. I just channel, and so yes, I, you know, it's like you start to let you. And that's the way to let go of the ego, so that you're no longer thinking about it. Like uh, these ideas. No, it's like the channel comes through, and then it's like you'll start to visualize something or you'll hear something and oh wow that's that's music i'm hearing or that's a that's a sentence that's a whatever that's that those are that's dialogue those are lines it's coming through and you let go of that whole attachment to i'm the creator of this because you realize that no it's just you're just a receiver like an antenna right that's coming through you <laughs> so where is it coming from <laughs> you reminded me of an experience that i had i've had many of these i i have spirit guides that i work with one being Carl Jung, another one being Rudolf Steiner, and another one being Rumi. And one time I was in meditation and all of a sudden this being showed up and he was in jail. He was in, a, in a, an old, old, like in a, in a cave in, in jail. And I said to him, I was actually meditating on poetry. I was working on writing poetry. And I just went into this state of no mind. And all of a sudden, it was like I'd remote viewed and I'm standing next to this guy in this jail and he's dressed in Islamic clothing. He's in all black. And I said, hi, what, what is your name? I said, somehow I've come to visit you. And he said, my name is Hafiz. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And he said, well, they've put me in prison because they don't like what I'm sharing in my poetry. And I said, well, I love poetry and I'm trying to learn to write poetry. He said, would you like some help? I said, sure. And of course I knew who Hafiz was, so I was really shocked that it was him. So he taught me how to write poetry in this very unique way. And I still have this in my notebooks. It's quite trippy. He, he says, okay, here's what I want you to do. And so he guided me through this process and I wrote this little poem. And then he said, now take any line and read it vertically. And I read it top to bottom. So there's like four or five sentences in a row. So think of like a paragraph. And it was a poem. He said, now read it, read it left to right. It's a poem. Read it right to left. It's another poem. Read it diagonally. So he actually showed me how to write a poem that's like a matrix that you could read it in any direction. And it was a poem. And wow. it made sense. It, wow. it actually told you something. And like, I could have never done that on my own. So there's an example of how that's relationship. That's love. And that's God talking to itself, guiding itself. And I've had so many of these experiences, it, they always just blow my mind. Now, if I told most people that, they'd think I was just bullshitting them. But I can tell you that because you have these experiences. And I think that's the magic that's missing. I think one of the problems with social media and gaming and, you know, you, you get trapped into this sort of matrix that's like you're going into another matrix that's less real and less important than the matrix you're in. So you actually start departing 
from the responsibilities of love, relationship, and evolution by distracting yourself and falling into the unconscious where you don't do the work of, of real growth and, and discerning paradoxically what's real and meaningful versus what isn't real and meaningful. Like it doesn't matter how good you are at video games if you can't get along with your wife and, and make enough money to support your family. And that's a real paradox we've got going on right now with, uh, you know, with the, the young generation as they're getting lost into, you know, like you look at Mark Zuckerberg and all this head, these, these um, what are they called, virtual reality headsets and people are losing touch with the, for example, I, I did a, a video once called The Danger of Living in Two Realities. And I said, look, the tree on your iPhone doesn't need water. You, you, you know, it, it doesn't get diseases. You don't have to have a relationship with it. But the trees all around us are dying because everybody's paying attention to digital trees. So there's an example of how the reality we live in, we're in so we can actually experience love, relationship, grow and evolve. And love always requires responsibility. But there's no responsibility to the tree on your iPhone. You don't have to water it. You don't have to take care of it. You don't have, it, it won't catch on fire. And so I think we're, we're, I think some of the, the dark forces are creating more and more matrices to distract us so they can do what the hell they want with the real matrix. And that, that I think is part of our rite of passage is we've got to stand up and get clear on what is actually real. Any thoughts in that regard? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's essentially what you're saying is very accurate. Going back to what I was saying about, how I think this there, the the portals that were opened essentially invited all these lower, lower, den lower dimensional, lower density uh, demonic entities in. I think they'll be relegated to those other those other <laughs> virtual realms because <laughs> they're not going to make the ascension. You know, they're not going to make the ascension with with Mother Earth as as, as she awakens and and uh, awakens our hearts within us to be more connected to her. Yeah, you know, ultimately. We can say it's problems, but really, as you know, it's not. It, nothing is a problem. Everything, everything has resolution. Everything will be resolved in its time. You know, it's just like death. Okay, those that aren't ready to to be here or don't no longer need to be here for this part of the experience. You know, they 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 shed their they shuffle off the mortal coil. I I see it again. It's just people are just different frequencies of consciousness, and yet to meet the singularity, there will have to be some level of integration of these different frequencies right into a more harmonious way of being i think that's really what's coming is greater harmony um for humanity i don't know if it's on the other side of a great conflict a great conflagration or if, if it can be done in a more smooth in a smoother way i don't i don't really know how it's going to play out um but it's like you create as you know it's like you create so much dissonance that at a certain point the dissonance actually finds its harmony and i I think that's really where we're moving into. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the podcast today. I've got some excellent news to share with you. The Bioptimizer's Black Friday mega sale is in full swing. And guess what? It's not just one day. It's happening throughout the entire month of November. This mega deal is available only for my listeners with my code. Yes, you heard me right. It's our little secret. Now, you already know that I have unwavering trust in bioptimizers. These guys are the real deal when it comes to improving digestion. And let's not forget their top-of-the-line magnesium. It's truly the best on the market. Plus, they back up their products with a rock-solid 365-day money-back guarantee. No questions asked. And you know damn well if they were selling junk, they would never do that. They'd go broke. And I use these things every day. I only offer them to you because they work. Now is your time to fill up your shopping carts and stock up on Bioptimizer's goodness. Trust me when I say this, you won't find a better Black Friday deal anywhere else, not even on the mighty Amazon. And these are not just ordinary supplements. As I said, they work and I do use them every day. And I'm best buddies with Wade Lightheart, the co-founder of Bioptimizers. And he's a spiritual man that would never mess with people. He puts his heart and soul, as does his partner, on creating products that really work. And they do tons of research on this stuff. If you haven't listened to my podcast with Wade Lightheart, they're very good. This is the biggest discount you can get. So why not stock up while you're at it? 
and get some amazing early Christmas gifts for people you love. And there may even be some gifts for you with purchase that are available on my page, which is B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. That's by Optimizers, B I. O P T I M I Z E R S dot com forward slash living number four little d. That's bioptimizers dot com forward slash living four d with the code Paul ten. That's little p a u l ten. This Black Friday, I challenge you to put your health at the top of the list instead of impulse purchases. Why not focus on what really matters? Your health and that of your loved ones. Don't miss out on this mega deal for my listeners only. Head over to bioptimizers.com forward slash living number four D and enter the code Paul 10 at checkout. I promise you, you will look and feel better because you did. Lots of love. Happy Black Friday shopping. When I had my meeting with you to prepare the podcast, something unique about you struck me and I wanted to ask you about it because I've, I've, I, I really value this quality that you expressed to me that I picked up in you. And it was this, I, I got the feeling that you like to let your life be guided from the now, the present moment, not live too much in the past, future, or in your head. Uh, this is often referred to in Taoist practice as living in no mind. I'd love it if you can share how you engage the journey of life and any specific experiences that impact or influence your living spiritual philosophy, how your way of living feeds into your work and how your experiences relate to the journey we're all on and what others can learn from your life lessons as you've managed them. So if that's clear. <laughs> you yeah. ask the longest questions. I'm always like, I don't so, know where to start. <laughs> no, it's funny. It's just funny. Like, you know, you bring up so much. Um, Sorry, I have a lot to think about. You know, I'm, 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 <laughs> I've got a very active inner life, you know. I'm sure I, I can tell. It's good. You know, it's like, I just, I feel, I didn't say, my, when I was younger, I was I would consider myself like an intellectual when I was in my teens, especially my teens into my, into my 20s, my early 20s, right? There was like a real time period of a lot of, book learning, a lot of study, deep study and reading and reading and just uh, uh, thinking and trying to basically create and like to know, like to recognize patterns. But it also like one thing about history is like you, you look at the patterns of history, but, and you apply it to the moment, but then you try to extrapolate into the future and you fall into all kinds of problems with the future. And, and I noticed this in my own life, you know, trying to predict way things would go from a mental perspective, but the only predictions that ever really held in a sense was intuition was feeling and it was less and it's like it was less distinct sometimes you get into like flashes or like moments of like oh i can visualize that or i see that or i really just feel that um but the mind wants to come in and interpolate its projection from the past onto the future and it just it never works that way so when you try to strategize your life from a perspective of the mind you know thinking linearly or some kind of you know scripting of of scenarios or whatnot it just doesn't work yeah and it, there's I too many there's too many options it, it's it because it's co-creative it's if, if it was just me if i was a creator sure i could script everything but i'm not so i'm co-creating so it has to be an alignment and you, you know you learn this when you know you do anything right whether you're uh directing a film or coordinating you know whatever you're coordinating a an experience where you're trying to create a coordinated experience with people. You're trying to gather a bunch of people together. I mean, it's like everyone has their own experience of reality. Everyone's going to bring their own, their own uh, spontaneity, right? Their own idiosyncrasies to the moment. So ultimately it's like, I, I work to get to more to a place of intuition, which is, as you say, being in the moment. And sometimes it really, you know, it's, it's like the major thing I have to fight is the expectation that, is belief system and patterning, right? We have to deprogram those patterns or those those belief systems that you need to work these hours or you need to be doing something or you need to be working on something. It's just like, if I don't feel guided to work on something, I better just sit and just sit with it. And it's hard. That's like probably one of the hardest things I think in life is to just 
don't feel guided to do anything and you're not sure what to do, can you just sit and allow yourself to observe? And as the observer, to see, you know, what's coming up. And again, this, this is at the heart, I think, of, of our, I don't want to say polarity. It's like this discourse, this relationship, because the relationship isn't just with us and others, it's with us and ourselves. Because there is like the observer within us that does seem like connected to God or maybe, you know, or to higher dimensional beings. And it's like they're watching this human version of ourselves flawed and all and just kind of going okay it's okay you're okay <laughs> which, which could be the human version of themselves <laughs> could be <laughs> meaning they can be projecting this i mean when you think of the concept of the higher self it's you know it's like bentov jung many others even myself and probably you have had experiences of realizing there's an aspect of yourself that is witnessing it all, experiencing it all, but is at the same time detached from it. And this is like the Atman that cannot be burned or destroyed ever. Exactly. And so th there's there's the, the you know, and and in, in 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 Hinduism they say Atman is Brahman and Brahman is Atman. So you know, Atman is soul, God is soul, and soul is God. So there's really the God aspect. And then you say, well, all dimensions are expressions of the divine. So at every level, there's, uh, the, the, you know, the Russian doll has another layer, another layer, another layer. And so something's always above something witnessing it. You know, like we look at our children. I've got three kids. I look at them and I, I see myself and sometimes go, oh, my God, there I am. And sometimes I go, oh, wow, they're, they're even more smart than I am, which is frequently. And so you you. You know, we we can I can find myself sitting there in, in in kind of like a no mind repose, just watching my own children and being detached, but yet simultaneously in love with and attached and concerned for. And so it you know I, I think that these qualities of God actually manifest in our lives all around us, but most people don't take enough time to self-reflect or just to empty themselves to witness. So they get so caught up in it. They don't really realize that they are actually at all these higher levels participating and co-creating. And I think that's the difference between being unconscious and being truly conscious and, uh, and awakening. You, you come to the realization that I'm creating a lot of what's going on in my life. It's, it, you know, first we feel like we're the victim. Then we wake up and realize, no, wait, wait a minute, you know, maybe... Maybe I created that or I co-created that and I have to become more conscious so I don't keep creating what I don't want Right. and can use the same power that I use to create what I don't want to, to create what I do want. I tell a lot of my patients, look, you're using your creative power, the divine within you, to create cancer, to create back pain, to create financial stress. Do you realize that if you just reorient yourself towards using the same power of manifestations in ways that are dream affirmative that you will start seeing things change and i went through this myself because my parents fought constantly over money i realized one day i I'm, i've made millions and millions of dollars but i never seemed to have any fucking money and it was driving me crazy but my wife angie she's got she seems to be got the midas touch i mean everything she she thinks about money and it manifests she says i'm, I'm I get a little low on money and I just change my mind and money shows up. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I said, you know, I need you to teach me that because I've worked my fucking ass off my whole life and I've got millions and millions of dollars flowing through and paying all these employees and buildings and all the stuff. But I never seem to have enough money for doing things like that, that makes me feel like I'm financially stable. And so she started working with me to show me how to change my orientation toward money. And as I began practicing that, I started having abundance all around me. And I, I realized, okay, there, this is just one of a myriad of examples of what happens when you change your conscious orientation toward anything in life. It is, it is. And it's, it's one thing that I think it scares people because it, it requires such responsibility. It right? does. So Being a co-creator is, is a lot of responsibility. Exactly. So the more you take that emphasis, that onus onto your, okay, you know what? I accept the kingship. Yeah. And the right? queenship. Or the queenship as a woman. 
that's scary because it, it it looks good when you're looking at it but when you it but it feels it's if you if you're not ready to hold that energy that feeling it's it can be a huge burden right heavy as the head that wears the crown it's, it's for a reason and so uh, this is a fundamental consciousness of scarcity as we know that's part of why humans have created these conditions for themselves for for the last two thousand years you know, a feudal system was basically of, of servitude because at one level it was easier to create a matrix system that just kind of took care like, how do you say? Uh, it's like being in the military where someone's always feeding you. <laughs> yeah, well, ex exactly. I mean, and it's not right to say that because, I mean, people are working hard for their for their food, but it's like at a psychological level, I think a lot of, a lot of us have felt traumatized and afraid of the onus that comes with being the sovereign man and woman, and so that's that's a big shift it, it, that has to, that that is occurring, I think now, and, and will occur more as we have, enter this new Earth modality on the other side of the singularity point. It's like it becomes more harmonious. It becomes more about working and operating as you know as as sovereigns, right, with respect and love and, and consideration, but also on knowing and honoring ourselves. And being able to to have our our boundaries and and how we relate and how we create agreements and you know not a, not contracts but agreements um, going forward, I just I think there's a whole new modality on the other side of it. It's just and it's it's starting. I think that's where my consciousness is going, and 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 that's there's also obviously all the energy that comes with it because it's like when is this happening? You don't know until it's there. <laughs> it can feel like it's around the corner. That can be years. That can be days. You know literally just sit with where you're at and just, okay, I'm on the journey. The universe is giving me what I need to work with, where I need to be at any moment, trusting the process, just like riding a horse. You know, it's like, well, when do you get there? Well, first, just, just be with the experience. <laughs> just be with the experience. You know, sometimes the pace is fast, sometimes it's slow. Sometimes you got to walk. Just, just be with that process. You know, when you were talking earlier about your process of like working on a project or something and you, you if you don't feel like doing it, then you, you kind of have to sit down and, and reorient yourself or see, you know, wait till you really do feel like doing it. I, I was reminded uh, there's a man named Arnold Patent. Uh, and I think the guy that wrote these, he wrote uh, 24, I think it is, universe, 22 or 24 universal principles and you reminded me of one of them. And in, in one of the universal principles, he says, um, if you don't like what's happening in your life, lay down and wait until the urge to act out of duty or obligation passes and only get up when you can do it out of love. Mm, and I think that's that's a pretty potent statement. And I've I've actually practiced that many times because, you know, as you can imagine, running an institute and multiple businesses and being an author and a podcaster and a video and coaching clients through all sorts of life crises. There's a lot of demands on me. So sometimes I just have to lay down and, and wait until that sense of duty and obligation passes and, and get up when I can do it out of love. And I found it to be quite a profound um, practice. I mean, sometimes I think, God, I, I need to take two weeks off. I'm burned out. And I lay down, I've got a beautiful terracotta stone floor here in my office. And I lay down and sometimes it's only five minutes and I just say, okay, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do this right now. Cause I just, I don't, I just don't have it in me to, to give something to somebody else. I have, I got to give myself a minute to just be with me. And when I first lay down, I think I might end up being here for two or three hours, or I might blow the whole day off and get myself even more behind but only in a few minutes, I wake up and I go, okay, I don't, you know, wake up. I mean, I, I, I come to the point where I say, okay, I feel ready to do this now and I can do it out of love. And, and so sometimes I think just stepping back from it and looking at our own story and just detaching from it for a few minutes can really have a, a, a revitalizing effect. I like that. I think mean, it's a great, it's a great point. <laughs> Well, Sean, uh, what an amazing chance to sit with you. It's it's a real pleasure because you know when you, when you know I really have a lot of respect for your mind, and I've as I said I've watched your TV shows and and I've 
uh, I've seen uh, your your four part series on the sex trafficking and the Satanism and all that stuff was a is a very powerful powerful piece of work. And I when I watched that, I said, okay, that's it. I got to get Sean on my podcast and talk to him. And it was just by the grace of God that I was able to through connections reach you. So I'm really grateful that you spent this time with me and my listeners and. So I would just love to to close out by saying, is there any closing comments or words of inspiration you might have? And then where can people find you or where would you like to direct them? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think we covered such a gamut of of information and ideas. It's just, it's been fun to sit with this space and to listen to you, introduce me to some, some authors I'm going to have to check out. Um, But for people that want to learn more about me and my work, seanstone.info, my website, that's got all the links, social media links, my documentaries, uh, my book, uh, my multiple books. I think that's, you know, that's the place, seanstone.info. Well, thank you, Sean. I really appreciate it. I, I, I will uh, send you an invite to book another podcast. I'm running a few months in advance now, so we'll have time to let this one digest with people. But uh, I think you and I can have a pretty fun rap session about a lot of things. So lots of love to you, Sean, and I'm looking forward to seeing what what the genius of Sean brings up next. And uh, um, I'm sure lots of people are too. So uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to my sponsors. I hope you guys enjoyed our dialogue today. And uh, I look forward to sharing something amazing with you real soon. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Sean Stone. You can visit Sean online at seanstone.info, where you can find out more about his new workshops, The Art of Success and Heart Magic, book a consultation with Sean, and browse his other work. Connect on Instagram and Facebook at The Real Sean Stone, on Twitter at Watching Sean, and on his Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Sean Stone. His latest six part documentary series, Best Kept Secret, can be viewed on iconic.com, that's I C K O N I C.com, 107daily.com, and Vimeo On Demand. You can catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors by Optimizers, Organifi and Paleo Valley, our podcast sponsors Ned and Wild Pastures and our preferred product sponsor Peak Life. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for listeners. The links are in the show notes. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. 